Good away. Michelle is a librarian and genealogist with the Lewiston Public Library and was recently appointed to fill the position of historian for the city of Niagara Falls. She has written, co-written, and edited several books on Niagara area history, including Juan Appetito, Niagara's early Italian-American culinary traditions. Kratz is the coordinator of the Italian Research Group at the Lewiston Public Library and a proud descendant of Niagara's early Italian-Americans. Michelle, thank you again. First of all, I want to apologize. I'm not Dr. Fader. I know you were all looking forward to him. He is quite an expert, and I looked at his book uh, as kind of the Bible of the ethnic communities of Niagara Falls. I don't believe anything ever was written before that. So, uh, again, I apologize. I tried. I had just a short time to put this together, and um, I hope you'll bear with me. But I'm also a writer, so more than a speaker, so I like to kind of write my things that I'm going to say to you so I don't forget things. But um, as she said, um, I run the local history and genealogy department at the Melissa Library, and uh, one of my volunteers is here, that, um, Pat, works very hard for us at the library. We do a lot of fun things over there. Um, I'm also going to talk quite a bit about Pete's favorite woman, uh, Elizabeth Howe because I really can't talk about the ethnic communities of the east side of Niagara Falls without mentioning one specific woman who lived here for a very short time and changed a lot of things and really did a lot of great work in Niagara Falls. Um, Pete introduced me to Elizabeth Howe many years ago. She was one, of, probably one of the most remarkable people to ever set foot in the city. I've read of her work, I've read her own words, there really was no one else who cared more for the poor, the destitute, the desperate. She gave unselfishly of herself to this city, which she didn't even belong to. She was from Boston, and she had worked all over the world before she came to Niagara Falls. And I'll tell you more about her as we talk through our presentation. And I invite you to try to learn more about her yourself. And when you're done, and when you've heard her story, and that of East Side Immigrants, I hope you'll be moved to sign a little petition that I have here. We have at the table right here. My mother's phone. Um, this petition is to add Elizabeth Howe to the beautiful monument in front of City Hall in Niagara Falls. And the monument reads as follows. To the memory of those pioneers and citizens of Niagara Falls who through their patriotism, self-sacrifice, and endeavors have contributed in an outstanding degree to the greatness of our beloved city. This monument is dedicated. And then the list follows with about a dozen or so men, all men, including General and Judge Porter, Mr. Hooker, Mr. Rankin, a lot of you know the people you'd expect to see on there. And the whole monument is is very hard to read in the first place. I take a picture and really pull it out to read it. So it, you know, maybe maybe as a story, and I could fix that monument up, and I'm hoping to add Elizabeth Howe. I'd love to have a woman on there, and especially her. Um, so we'll gather signatures, see what happens. I haven't talked to the mayor about it, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens with it. But at least we'll try. But I, I think it'll be a great day to give this woman her due, and I know he more than agrees with that because he's the one who really introduced me to her. I never would have known she existed in talking about her. Um, she's buried at Oakwood Cemetery, which is probably how you found her, <laughs> in the stunter section. But we like to think she was kind of a daredevil herself, um, fighting against all odds in Niagara Falls, especially once you hear more about what the situation was like. So through this talk, I'll give you a historical background on the ethnic Niagara Falls. And like I said, I'm not this great expert, but I did a lot of research and tried to put a, a nice presentation together for you, and I learned a lot myself. Um, but I also wanted to focus this presentation um, on research and genealogy, as we're all genealogists here, family researchers. So we're, we'll be talking about how to research these people from this time period and from this area. And of course, there's not enough time to cover all of the ethnic groups because there were several dozen when all said and done. So, but there are a few that were, you know, had larger numbers. And of course, um, 
I'm Italian. I've done a lot of research on the Italian angle of this, so that's more my area of expertise. Um, and I, as I was saying before, the um, the subject actually of the East Side ethnic community is very near and dear to me. I think I was telling you in an email or something that um, that's actually my first ancestors in Niagara Falls came to the East Side. They were Italian immigrants, and this is the history of my people and why I'm here. So I'm very happy to explore it and to help other people that have this history of these great pioneers. Maybe they weren't rich and famous people, but they're the backbone of the city. And as a historian, that's one thing I would really like to focus on is the ethnic people of Niagara Falls. Um, and I also wanted to mention again that I do run an Italian research group at the Lewiston Public Library. We published the very first history of Niagara Falls Italians last summer. We have the book right here. It's Bon Appetito is what it's called. Niagara's Early Italian American Culinary Traditions. And uh, some of our writers are actually, my mother wrote a piece, and uh, Pat helped a lot with it. And we're writing another book because we could not fit everything we wanted into this book. And we already have enough to, I think I'm going to have to divide it into two books, the one we have finished, or I'm working on finishing. It's such a rich history of these immigrant people. And then we also want to, when we're done with this, make a book on all of the ethnic groups of Niagara Falls. And we have a little sign up here. If you're interested, you're Polish, Armenian, Croatian, whatever you are, let us know. If you'd be interested in sharing your family stories, pictures, recipes, we want the fun stuff. We want the business, you know, the business people, the church stories, the school kids. We want, to me, this is the real history, the people. And I'm a Niagara Falls resident myself and grew up downtown and so much has been taken away and I never saw the glory of the past that everyone laments losing. I just grew up with everyone saying how terrible everything is. But as a genealogist, I feel the people are the most important part of history and you can't ever take away the people and their stories. So as a genealogist and as a writer and a librarian, and historian, I, that's what I want to do. Is I want to focus on the poor people, these people that broke their backs for us and to make this city great. So, um, so that's a little introduction. Um, okay, so this is a map of that shows the east side. This is from the city directory of 1899, and I took a lot from Dr. Fader's book. If any of you haven't seen it, it is a spectacular book. And this, the directories are a great place to get maps, say you want to focus on a certain year. So right here, you can see what we're talking about, this area in the yellow, I highlighted. It's defined as a six by three block area going east from 10th Street to Portage Road between Niagara Street and Buffalo Avenue. So you can see, here's, here's Oakwood Cemetery. And Niagara, Buffalo Avenue, Portage, and Tenth. So that's the area that's generally referred to at this time period as the east side. We're talking about the early side. We're not going to get into more modern history. We're saying more on this 1880 to 1930 period. Now, as I said before, the directories are just awesome to look through. Um, if you look in the censuses, and if you look through the directories and the censuses, through your own family history, if you're from around here, you'll see that this area was inhabited by so many different ethnic groups. It's mostly a ghost town today, but at one time it was very alive and bustling community. And I was just telling you a few moments ago, but um, until I started to seriously research my family history, I assumed my family was always from a certain part of the city, which was uh, my grandparents lived on Woodlawn Avenue and uh, 19th Street. Uh, I always figured, well, we're up, that's where we're from. Until one day my grandmother, who's 90, and I, we drove through the city, and she pointed out all the places she lived, and all the places her parents lived, and her grandparents lived in the city. And I was like, oh my gosh, we live there? A lot of them, places are just desolate fields now, and very run down. But I found that day that our family story in America begins on the east side. And perhaps many of yours do as well. 
And now that I look back, too, I imagine so many of my friends, people I grew up with, I went to Our Lady of Mount Carmel School in Niagara Falls, also descended from these people uh, from the east side. And I knew that so many of my friends behind their ponytails and their blue jeans were Armenian, Lebanese, Polish, or Italian and German like me. And my great-grandmother, my mother will know this, always asked my friends where they were from. And she did not mean the street or the neighborhood or their address. She meant where were they really from? Where was their DNA from? I think I grew up to be a lot like my great-grandma, Valentina Matruska Fortuna, who fled Italy to escape an arranged marriage, and that I want to know where everyone is really from, too. And I do inquire about your DNA. <laughs> um, so our talk is going to deal mostly with these ethnic people that live in that area at this time. They're alike in many ways, and they're different in many ways. Some have special record collections that you can use to research them, and others have the same, pretty much, some shared sources. And again, if you want to delve deeper into, there's so much history to go into this time period, this community. If you, you could go into the power stories, the, um, all of the um, industry and all that. Can't, not enough time to talk about all that today, and I'm nowhere near an expert. It's huge, huge history of this area. But um, we're going to focus more on the genealogy of these people. And it was also called Tunnel Town because of the mile-long tunnel, which kind of drew people here for work. This is a great picture. Of, this is on the front cover of Dr. Fader's book. This was taken from the Shredded Wheat Building around 1901. So it's kind of a bird's eye view into what was called Tunnel Town. This community of immigrant workers came to be known as Tunnel Town, as I said, because it formed around and because of the hydroelectric tunnel. The labor of immigrants was needed to build the mile-long tunnel and above-ground canal for the Edward Dean Adams power plant east of the falls, and they came in droves to Niagara Falls. In 1890, engineers announced that 200 men were needed for digging shafts or portals for the first phase. The later construction, they thought, they said, required 800 men. And the need for the brick lining of hydro masonry led to the call for Italian immigrants who had been working on the Croton Dam, like Pat's family. They excelled at this sort of work, and they indeed came to Niagara Falls as well. The first immigrants were the Irish and the Germans, and they were also summoned by the hydraulic power development around the 18th. But by the late 1880s, it was the Southern and Eastern Europeans who came to help dig the Great Tunnel. And it was then that the Tunnel Town emerged, as Dr. Feder writes in his book, as an unplanned living area for ethnic workers living within the Tunnel District. In 1896, the Hydraulic Canal brought another wave of immigrant workers. The age of electricity with its industrial potential brought, brought a great deal of workers to this area. Niagara Falls desperately needed the manual laborers. And these immigrants made substantial contributions to the development of electric power. They're often forget, forgotten. Uh, just all the, the big power company leaders I remember, but a lot of these men gave their lives building these things. And according to um, Dr. Fader, I found this was interesting because I was wondering myself, were they forced to live here, or was this somewhere they just, you know, ended up living? And uh, he believes the prevalent theory of the time period for dealing with ethnic communities was containment, so basically a ghetto. Tunnel Town, or the east side, was a result of a containment policy as well as a convenient location for the ethnic groups. So in both ways, um, the city did want it to, and the power companies wanted to contain these strange ethnic people, but also they wanted to stick with themselves, with their own kind too. So this melting pot of the east side grew, and honestly it became a key to the success of the city, and so much is still here. And today, we're not going to talk about today, everything that's happened, but if you drive through you'll see a drastic uh, shift of population, and that's not at all, this, this is the thing of history books. Okay, what you're looking at here is a survey from Elsie Burgess Jones describing the situation on the east side in 1919. 
and she was secretary for immigration and foreign committees. This was considered a bird's eye view of the foreign population of the city. And it's, it's hard to read, it's even hard to read up close. It's very blurry. Um, but this was done in order to decide should Niagara Falls have an international institute? The situation in Tunneltown, or the east side, was not very rosy in 1919 at the time of this report. Crime was rampant, there were constant threats of disease, social problems, unsanitary conditions, problems with public safety, and saloons. And what contributed a lot to this was a great deal of the population were single men that were just boarding in these houses. So unfortunately, a whole population of single men leads to some problems um, <laughs> and a lot of saloons. And so the, the rest of the community, you know, some houses of ill repute. I mean, you read through the old newspapers, there was a lot of trouble in Tunnel Town at this time. And interestingly enough, um, you know, the city did not know what to do. So they had all these meetings, they did all this, and I was so, it, it was so amazing to find out that even um, Jacob Reese, the social reformer who wrote How the Other Half Lives, he came to Niagara Falls to talk about the situation, help the city deal with the situation, how to remedy the problems that occur with poverty. And, but his approach, which was published in the papers, was the best remedy was education. And he felt the children of these people should be the focus of everything. That some of these people, it was so hard to get through. But the children were, were learning English, and the children were more, uh, we could mold them into Americans and stop a lot of the social, these social problems. And this was the, exactly the same approach that uh, the International Institute and Ms. Elizabeth Howe pursued in her work in Niagara Falls, was education, number one. Now, the numbers that you're looking at in here, you can read them yourself. Um, they came from a Chamber of Commerce housing survey in the census of 1915, along with, uh, she consulted with uh, doctors, physician, or midwives, priests, and other workers who were working right with these people, right in the neighborhoods, and they knew the situation firsthand. And uh, you could see the huge number of Italian, 10,000, Polish, 10,000, um, Armenian, the Austrians, that was during all the turmoil with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so a lot of people are thrown into being called Austrian. Um, this was almost half of the population of the city. So you can imagine, they thought, we gotta do something about this. This is a huge, if it could spiral into a worse problem. But um, another thing Dr. Fader points out in his book that uh, was studied is that the only other city in New York that had numbers like the percentages like this of immigrants was New York City. So it's Niagara, or New York City and Niagara Falls with this sort of situation going on. You could also yourself look through the 1915 census. Sometimes, as genealogists, it's fun to just go through pages of the census. And uh, you can see um, who is living with who. You can see the neighborhoods very up close. It's almost like looking back in time. Uh, you can see the jobs and the places of origin. So that's where they got all this information from. And it was decided they definitely needed an international institute. Now, um, the International Institute was probably one of the most important things that ever happened in the city. Terrible picture again from the Niagara Gazette. It's hard to read. It's from March 8th, 1920, and the caption reads, there are 12 women, all foreign born in this group, which constitutes one of the Italian English classes at the Institute. This is the only known photograph we have of Elizabeth Howell. Have you found anything recently? This is the teacher up here. She must have been very modest because there are no photographs anyone can find of her. Um, but luckily for us, she left wonderful notes behind. And just the records of her work statistical records even tell a story in itself. Um, when you read through these records and these notes, you'll notice something very special went on at 1116 East Wall Street, which is totally gone. 
at a former macaroni factory. It's a very human story, and I wish that everyone could read her notes. But I would like to find if I can have the permission to put that on line. I don't. I just don't know who owns the. The microfilm came from Minnesota originally. Is where I found it. Housed it. Um, I can't remember which university has it, but they sent it on an interlibrary loan. That's where I printed it from. Yeah. That microfilm. So they probably had the ownership of it. And I can certainly look at that to see if they wouldn't let us just put it up. Right. Because we, a volunteer at the library went through and she transcribed it because the microphone was terrible. It's hard to read it. And uh, we pulled what we could and I think you pulled some great stuff out of it. This story, I, it's our story of Niagara Falls. It's a story of desperate, frightened immigrants, many fleeing genocide, war, and poverty, wanting only to better their lives and the lives of their children and grandchildren. In fact, I wonder how often, how many of them just thought of us. That they knew that they weren't going to make it, that they were just going to struggle every day of their life. But I wonder, at the end of the day, they thought, you know what, someday my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, they're going to make it, because this is America. You know, and I think um, even though they were poor, and they, they, all they had was their hard work to go on, but they knew here in America they could do this. And I, I think that about my great-great-grandfather, and I'll show you a little bit more of him, because I'm going to focus on like one immigrant from each, not each, but from a few ethnic groups, but my great-great-grandfather was an illegal alien, basically, and he was a stowaway as a little boy. And he was, uh, they threatened to throw him overboard, but luckily someone, one of the sailors, had a heart and didn't. And this is how the story goes, but instead he came to America and he came over 14 times. Uh, his name was Angelo Vatresca. I never met him. You never met him either. He died in the And he was a laborer, like so many of our ancestors. He didn't make the papers, he didn't make any history books, but he was a hard worker. And um, I'm proud. And he first came here in 1895, which was quite a long time ago. I thought our family came over more in the 1920s. I never realized we were here that long. And he lived various places on the east side, and then on uh, 19th Street in what is now Fortuna's restaurant. That's our family's restaurant, but he lived there when he died upstairs. Our family lived there, too. But back to the International Institute. Elizabeth Howe, she arrived here in 1919, right after all this survey and all this trouble was going on. She employed mostly ethnic caseworkers because she knew they were the ones that really knew what was going on. And she also employed all women and young women. We're going to talk about one of her workers a little bit. She knew that the biggest barrier was language. So she wanted people, she wanted these people to learn English, first of all. She was brave, she was plucky. When you read through her notes, she was a tough woman. And she was undaunted. Nothing, nothing put her down. When you read, again, you, she was like a warrior. She was set for battle and Many battles she lost, but I think when you look at all of us, I think she won in the end. I'm going to give you a few little tidbits from her monthly reports just to tell you in a month some of the things that went on at this International Institute. Clothes given to 32 people. Layettes given to six mothers. People interviewed by staff, and she gets, gives numbers. This is just for January. 261 Italians, 138 Armenians, 148 Polish. It goes all the way down filled out certificates of arrival, accompanied Italian girl to Paperville to get a job, held Polish English class 12 times, 140 people present, accompanied two little Polish girls to lock court twice for grand jury, father had murdered their mother, children are witnesses, acted as translator, got warrant for Polish woman to have her husband arrested, telephone board of health to send doctor to poor Lithuanian family, they sent doctor, ordered coal for five families, work found for seven people, number of babies taken care of, 104, and a big Armenian party. <laughs> Unfortunately, Ms. Howe, who suffered from bouts of bronchitis and pneumonia, she died at Niagara Falls Memorial Hospital in 1922. She literally worked herself to death. The city came out to pay their final respects. Thousands came out of immigrant people that she had helped. 
this wonderful woman. She saved so many people's lives. Another thing they did quite often, and you see this in the notes of the International Institute, was uh, basically the rescuing of Armenian people during the genocide years. Um, so many people that were here, that made it here, their only thought was to get their family out of there and to here. So they ran a huge operation um, out of the International Institute. Um, one of her workers especially, a teenage girl and another woman, um, they sent massive amounts of money to the Near East Fund and then rescued people. And a lot of these people, their descendants are here in the city today. Um, so as you can see, um, Another thing, there was a lot of parties and fun going on, too. She, Elizabeth Howe not only wanted to teach people to be American, but she wanted them to remember their cultures and their traditions. So if you look through the old newspapers, again, I have scrapbooks, <coughs> I think you gave me, too, that happy, um, um, just all the events that went on at the International Institute. Um, and it carried on after Elizabeth Howe died. Um, it was truly a labor of love the Eastside community, thanks to her and her wonderful workers. We're going to talk about one more of her workers. And then there's another one that I wrote about in our new Italian book that um, I just fell in love with. These people that gave so much of themselves for poor pe people who really desperate needed help. Um, so I hope, as I said, we have a petition going around. I would love for Elizabeth Howe's name to be added onto this um, statue in front of City Hall. It said there's no women on there, and I believe she helped thousands and thousands. And if you count the descendants of the people she helped, there's a lot of people. Um, and you can visit her now at Oakwood Cemetery. Now, the Italians, this is a beautiful grave from uh, St. Joseph's Cemetery. In 1919, the Italians, as you saw, number 10,000. They were coming like crazy to Niagara Falls, especially at the time of 1910 to the early 1920s. And according to Dr. Fader, the East Side immigrants, Italians, along with the Polish, were the earliest Southern and Eastern Europeans to come to the city. And they settled in the areas I mentioned here, um, East Falls Street, Niagara Street 29, someplace on the North End, too. And when they did all these surveys, they noticed a lot of these people were living in very terrible conditions. And you can read more of that in Dr. Fader's book, too. They, the Italians came, we talked about this a minute ago, are mostly initially as stone cutters and bricklayers. They had done a lot of the same type of work at the Croton Dam. And uh, some of these people, Pat's family, the Skelzos, um, they all they came from pretty much the same area of Italy too, where they must have done a lot of this in Italy, in Gimigliano in Calabria. Um, in fact, he says in his book there are so many, um, so many Italians from this one part of Italy came. You can actually today compare phone books and directories from the same town, Gimigliano and Niagara Falls, and see the same names. It's quite amazing. It was said, um, April 23rd, 1893, Italian masons were laying 600,000 bricks a day in the tunnel walls. Can you imagine the back-breaking work these immigrant people did here? Um, I also want to mention at the Lewiston Library, because so many of our Italian research group members and so many people are from this area of Italy, we bought all of the microfilm from there. So we, that's part of our permanent collection. So. Um, again, a wonderful piece of our Niagara Falls ethnic history. Um, and later I'm going to show you something, um, how to find the, some places of origin. It's a fun website um, to find your surname, a place of origin of your surname. And it's very telling about the ethnic breakdown of Niagara Falls, too. Um, it's interesting to note, too, that today, Italians still make up the largest ethnic group in Niagara Falls. More than 17 million uh, Americans claim Italian descent, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, They're the fourth largest ethnic group in the U.S. You can see this in the U.S. Federal Census, as most Niagara Falls residents declare Italian to be their first ancestry. And I'll tell you more how you can view this, too, for your own towns or wherever you want to look it up. 
Southern Italy, or the Mezzogiorno, especially saw very hard times following the unification of Italy in the 1870s. The North saw more prosperity, where the South, the Southern part of Italy was more rural peasant farmers. They had great economic hardship at this time. And along with that, I didn't realize, but they had natural disasters that killed hundreds of thousands, um, volcanoes, earthquakes. It was just, they were kicked when they were down type thing. So as the um, immigration laws changed and, and allowed for more Italians to come to the US, they came like crazy because they had really no other options. Um, and most of them came from Abruzzo, Calabria, and Sicily. They came to Niagara Falls, the southern Italian. Language was one of the largest barriers um, to advancement and to assimilation, to getting jobs. I mean, just imagine coming to a foreign country immediately and having no knowledge. Many didn't even know how to write in their own language, let alone um, learn another language. Um, and I know from my own family even, a lot of the women especially did not learn English. They fought it. They did not want to learn English. And, um, Often, uh, Elizabeth Howe writes in her notes that she would often go to the children because the children would translate for the workers. But there's many things you need to know the language of the country you live in, so this really held them back. And the International Institute, she just was unbelievable in her efforts to teach English and also to teach the old languages. She wanted everyone to still have that tie to the old country. The church was a big factor, too, in the um, Niagara Falls, uh, St. Joseph, St. Mary's, the Catholic churches. Um, in 1919, St. Joseph's School, if you can imagine this, had 1,000 students. It's hard to believe. And now it's gone. And there's not even that many in the whole city school, or Catholic school. Um, priests such as Father Valerio, that uh, <laughs> how didn't like very much in the beginning, but uh, he did help a lot of the immigrants. A lot of them go, uh, would go to the priest for help. I mean, he was sometimes the only source for help. Um, then societies grew out of this time period too, the Sons of Italy and the Christopher Colombo Society. They were formed to help people in crisis, but also as fraternal and fun place, to, to have fun, to celebrate your heritage and your traditions. Um, and the Christopher Colombo Society is still alive today, more of a cultural fun type of society, and uh, I, I haven't tried yet, but they said you can call there and they can um, give you some information on their records, which Grandma says Grandma and Grandpa were members. So I'd like to see what kind of records they do have there that they let us ask, you know, take a look at. But, um, Il Risveglio, the Italian Awakening weekly newspaper, is another um, big part of the Italian life in Niagara Falls. It covered all the local Italian news. Uh, first published around 1920, it ran to the 1940s. But unfortunately, we can't find anything available. Um, there's one copy of, at uh, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York. It's like 1946, of one year. I did talk to Dr. Fader about this before, and he said he has them, or I don't know. We'll have to see, because I think that would be just fantastic if we can digitize it, add it to Fulton history. And uh, of course it's in Italian, but you could still figure it out, I think. Um, so we'll work on him. We're trying to, I'm trying, trying to tell everyone I know, there's got to be something left of this newspaper somewhere. And my great-great-grandfather loved it. My grandma always says that. He sat there and he read it page to page. He just was so proud and he loved it because he could read it well and that was his paper. This is my grandpa, I'll just tell you again. I love his mustache, his passport, passaporto. Um, he was what was called a bird of passage. A lot of Italian men were referred to as this, which meant they would go back and forth, back and forth. They were not your typical immigrants who just came to America, stayed here forever, and planted themselves. He came back 14 times, is what the story says. I've only found passenger records for so many years, but I think he kind of snuck in a few times. So. But he did make it legal, and we, I have his nationalization paper, so, um, <coughs> but what a tough man. You know, he came as a little boy, a stowaway. Um, I, I had trouble finding him, too, and uh, if you're of ethnic heritage, the last names sometimes are screwed up on things, and uh, I found him under Vantry, 
uh, Ventry a lot, but we never changed our name to Ventry, but the census workers somehow changed it. On very, I think the only census I have him on, his name is Ventry, but he never changed his name to that. But I don't believe anyone in the household spoke English at that point. So that could explain it. Um, as I said, he worked for the railroad, um, a laborer. He worked very hard his whole life. He had a beautiful garden. My family lived upstairs from what is now Fortuna's restaurant on 19th Street, if you're familiar with Niagara Falls. Um, and then his daughter's son-in-law and his son started a Fortuna's restaurant in 1945, which is, this is the 70th anniversary year. But he died in that house, in, in that building. Um, I was telling her earlier, my family has a very, um, I don't know if there's any other businesses that has such a, a long family history in one building in Niagara Falls. It's still a business alive today. My daughter is now waitress at Fortuna's, and this would be her great, great, great grandparents lived in that building, and now she's the fifth generation to be there. So at first she doesn't, she's not interested in genealogy or anything, but now she's kind of like, well, that's pretty cool. It's, she's proud, you know, I think she, it's different to work there than her job at the mall. So, and my grandfather's buried at St. Joseph's Cemetery, my grandmother. Eventually his wife, my grandma, great, great grandmother, and not all of the children, but many of them came to Niagara Falls and stayed here. Because the women never went back. <laughs> the men would go back and forth. The women, <laughs> my great grandma, she never wanted to go back, right? No, you remember that. Um, now, for special Italian record collections, as I said, we really focus on Italian records at Lewiston Library. I apologize that we focus so much on just the Italian, but we'll help you with anything. But that's our family, and we're proud of it. And uh, it's just because that's what we work with a lot. Um, but we have. Um, a lot of microfilm, and we digitized some and uh, transcribed some uh, St. Joseph's church uh, cemetery records. They won't let us do the others, <laughs> but you can go to St. Joseph's church and get birth marriage stuff and for your own families. Um, we also have microfilm for Sacred Heart Church and Gate of Heaven in Riverdale, which a lot of Italians are in those places also. And our blog that we keep in the library, that's the name of it. Um, we put everything on there pretty much. So any um, digitized records, whatever, try to keep it in one place. That way, instead of just having it at the library, people from all over can access it. Because that's the thing in Niagara Falls, a lot of people have moved away that are doing history. So it's nice for them to be able to just go online and it's all there. And down below you can see these are some of the books at St. Joseph's. They're terrible, terrible shape, water damage, and. Um, State, um, which is why we wanted to do something with them quickly. But I think they would take them out in the cemetery with them probably to look for plots because they're wet. And, but um, we also, people donate stuff to us all the time. We had a lady come in with two big, huge boxes, and it was her mother in law's, and she didn't want them. It was junk to her. And it was unbelievable family history of the Carlo family. Pictures, I mean, there's records from Italy, yearbooks from Niagara Falls, uh, just remarkable stuff. So if anyone wants to get rid of stuff, we always say, I'll find out, find some place in the library. <laughs> but um, I just, for filler, put in this picture of an Italian wedding. Um, this is my brother-in-law's grandfather, John Pelecki, and his wife and his grandmother, Mary. And these are people, maybe some of you know, his sister, Kay Pelecki, married Sal Magley was famous baseball player and an Italian American from the Niagara Falls. The Barber. Okay, now onto the Polish. And as you can see, time is going. I could not cover all of these ethnic groups, but the Polish, along with the Italians, were the largest ethnic, other ethnic groups to settle on the east side. They didn't just come here for economic reasons, though. A lot of the Polish came here for uh, victims of war, refugees, and persecution. Um, and Dr. Fader, according to his book, uh, they know the first first the first recorded Polish immigrant to come and settler at Niagara Falls, Ignace, uh, Francis X. Ignacewski, arrived in 1887 and was employed by the Niagara Falls Power Company. Of course. The Polish resided at 14th Street, Adam Hans Street, and 15th Street, extending out to East Falls Street. 
and they had some also had some organizations that uh, assisted them, such as Echo of the Balkans and the Polish Drama Society. Again, a lot of these immigrants wanted to keep hold on to their culture, even though they wanted to become American and they knew they were going to stay here. They wanted to hold on to their precious culture. But nothing was more important than Holy Trinity, um, Holy Trinity Church, which is closed now as a church, but it, the building is still there and there's wonderful things going on there. And I'm. Oh, and you're. Yes. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay, perfect timing. So I thought I'll have the expert talk about <laughs> Holy Trinity. So, Marge? Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Marge Domogalski, and I'm with Niagara Heritage of Open Service. We're the organization that bought the former Holy Trinity Catholic, Roman Catholic complex from the Diocese of Buffalo. We purchased it in 2009 to, for several reasons. One, we wanted to give back to the community. As Michelle's been talking, that this was once such a thriving area and just the people and the immigrants. And I mean, I remember when there were homes. So we want to give back, help people in the community, but we also wanted to preserve our history as well because it is very important, like all of us, and that's why we're here. So some of the things we do is we are building our library of historic information, any pictures, any memorabilia that might be from the east side. We're looking to pick up. In our school, we have one room right now that's dedicated for that history, but we're going to look to expand it as well. We, on Fridays, have tours of the church. So starting next Friday, June through the end of September, we will be open from 6 to 8 p.m. Everybody's welcome to come in, take a tour. We talk about the history and go into more detail. Who started the parish? We have pictures of all of the pastors but one. There were 16 pastors. And so we talk about that history as well. And then just as a little side note, we do have a thrift store in the school that we open on Saturdays to help give back to the community. So people can donate their items, we put suggested amounts. It helps us because our organization is 100% volunteer based and donation based. So we get no money from any entity at all other than the generosity of people. So again, that's quickly what we look to do. Thank you for our website as well. I'm looking to build it up. We have the list of the pastors. I've got a list of now the principals who taught in the school. So I'm trying to build all of that base as well and have it there online for those to share. Yes? Do you have the address of the, that we should go to for this? I do, and I have flyers as well. It's 1419 Fall Street, but I have some information and our website as well. Thank you. And it is a beautiful church. Well, it's a whole block of buildings. The school, the church is absolutely stunning. And they wanted to even tear it down. Yes. Originally, that originally for saving. It's a labor of love and it's beautiful. So, you know what? I will just pass these around if anybody wants to take one. And um, I'll just move along here. Um, the Polish sphere influ influence was based on three factors according to his uh, research. The business community, which grew like crazy um, on East Fall Street, Quarry Road, Niagara Street. And here's a few little examples of Polish businesses. And he also wrote that the Polish workers often walked through the other neighborhoods. It must have been very friendly that they um, made such an impression when they walked to the factories on Buffalo Avenue. If you're familiar with Niagara Falls, Buffalo Avenue is lined with the factory. And many also came here with special skills. As I said, they didn't all come here for economic reasons. They fled terrible things back in Europe and war and different situations like that. So some were, were very skilled people. Um, um, I'm going to give you an example. I wish I had a picture of her. Angeline, because you can tell me the Polish. Yeah. <laughs> um, she kind of struck me. I love women's history, and she was a midwife and worked with Elizabeth Howe, worked in that part of the community. And the midwives are such an important part of these communities. Um, she was very well known among the Polish residents. Born in Poland, immigrated as infants. She was married to Max, um, who had several jobs. Um, they lived on 13th Street and 19th Street. Um, and I'm wondering, I think my grandmother said she was delivered by a Polish woman. And I, I kind of asked, you forget to ask that. 
I hope to find a picture of her one day. That would be great. Maybe <laughs> we'll keep in touch. Yes, I'd like to work with you on a lot of things. Same but. here. Um, Pete, I'm going to call on you to talk about this. this Pete Ames, um, my friend from Oakwood, a, a former president of the Friends of Local History here, trustee at Oakwood. Um, he's collected, um, even though this is not your background at all, you just like all the background, everyone's history, um, he collected several records um, dealing with the Polish immigrants. Um, these three, especially, the records of the International Institute, um, the Polish Weekly Review, which, like the Italian, this one served 20,000 Poles living in Niagara Falls, Tonawanda, Lockport, and Medina. And then also the records of General Holler's Blue Army. We'll talk about that for a minute. Um, we do have some of those records um, <coughs> of microfilm at the library. I'll show you an example in a minute. But if you want to sure. talk for a minute. Thank you. Um, like Michelle, I write everything down. Yeah. I'm not a public speaker, but I, I don't mind reading, so I'll do that if you don't mind. Uh, my interest in the East Side came about upon receipt of a collection of records from the International Institute that I inherited from a friend and former uh, Niagara County historian, Dorothy Rome. She just happened to be in the local history department upstairs here one day about 30 years ago when someone came in and asked if anyone would be interested in boxes of records that were being discarded. Mm -hmm. Dorothy followed them over to Portage Road and they loaded the boxes into her car. At the corner of Niagara Street and Portage Road is the empty building that was the girls' club. And prior to that, it was the, international, the last home of the International Institute. Unfortunately, that building has sat empty for years, so I don't know what's going to happen to it eventually. That should be a museum of the east side, along with the Echo Club and Holy Trinity. I mean, it, those three buildings are the mainstay of what's left of it. Um, Dorothy took them home for safekeeping. It turns out that someone had gone through the 40-some years worth of files and kept anything that contained people of Polish extraction. Of course, all the other ethnic groups we've talked about that settled here, all those records are gone. But we still have the Polish ones, fortunately. About five years ago, she passed them on to me, and I put them in binders alphabetically. Matt Parsonick, son of Mike and Betty Parsonick, spent weeks going through them, and he made a database of all the surnames who were mentioned. There's over 500 family names mentioned in those records, so if anybody has any kind of connection to a Polish family, um, I gladly provide copies of any information anybody can show me a, a family connection. There is sensitive information in some of the files, so I don't feel that I can house them in public form. Say, for instance, uh, drunken husband beats the wife, that, that sort of scenario. So consequently, the family, I don't mind passing that kind of information out to. just can't handle them in public form. Otherwise, I'd have them housed upstairs. But in the meantime, like I say, if anybody has any kind of Polish connection at all, feel free to contact me to look and see if I have anything. Uh, a couple of things came out of my research on the International Institute. It was one of hundreds formed after World War I as an arm of the YWCA in 1919 to assist female immigrants. Originally, it was to assist <coughs> women. That was, and it was an arm of the YWCA. Eventually, they, they took care of men's needs, naturalization, and so forth as well. But it was originally designed to assist uh, females. Its first home in Niagara Falls, as you said, was a former macaroni factory, 1116 East Fall Street, long gone. The director is Elizabeth Howe, who died after three years and was buried at Oakwood. I was able to obtain microfilm reports of her work that detailed a great deal of what life was like in Tunneltown. It was a melting pot of every ethnic group and they lived in less than desirable conditions. The Niagara Falls Institute was located in several locations over its 50-year existence and eventually ended up as the girls' club with its role in immigration assistance greatly diminished by the 1960s. The girls' club joined forces with the boys' club and relocated to 17th Street. So like I said, that building on Portage and Niagara Street has been, um, I don't know what it's been, <laughs> nothing having to do with uh, any of those things for quite some time. 
Uh, another facet of info that came from the records was that Pollard's army, which was made up of Polish aliens from all over the United States. Tens of thousands of Polish men were recruited through Falcon nests and sent to Western New York. From there, they were sent to Camp Niagara and Niagara on the Lake, which I believe became known at that point as Camp Kosciuszko to be trained, and on to New York City to go by ship to France. The U.S. hadn't joined the war at that point, so the President insisted the train take place in Canada. It couldn't take place in the United States because we weren't uh, part of the war at that time. Once the U.S. entered the fray, some recruits were housed in Fort Niagara in Youngstown. The group was led by General Holland to Free Poland. I discovered the names of about a half a dozen men who came from the Niagara Falls area who were part of the Blue Army. I had never heard of this group before, so it was interesting to learn more about them. I started a project to chronicle the local men. And as Michelle mentioned, she has some of her recruits in for a microphone at the Nielsen Niagara. The bulk of the information that I'm aware of, and maybe Al can add to that, is in Chicago, another large Polish community. But that's where a lot of the, uh, I think that's where the National is in Chicago. I believe so. Nat yeah. National Polish uh, Society. So there's more information there. But Michelle does have some on microphone with some of the local guys. Uh, one last item was the discovery of a Polish newspaper that was printed for 10 years on Portage Road, across from the Girls Club on Portage Road. Um, so that was there for 10 years, from 1921 to 1931. Uh, translated, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Polish name. Translated as Polish Weekly Review, I was able to obtain two reels of microphone that covered years 1928 to 1930. And we printed out the one that covers July 28 to June 29 <coughs> and put it in binders. There's um, one of the collections of those is in local history. And there's a copy here for anybody that wants to take a look through it um, while we're here. And there's an index of names that uh, Matt Parsnick developed for that as well. So if you see any of those names, feel free to uh, take a look through it. If I had any Polish blood in me and any Polish relatives in this uh, city, I'd love to have a copy of like my, my grandparents' wedding announcement or something. Polish. I mean, how cool could that be? I mean, it just would be awesome. So if anybody is looking for something, there could be some things in there that would uh, really add to your collection. Um, as I mentioned, I've got a copy of the surnames from the International Institute with me if anybody wants to look for their family or someone they know. I brought the copies of the Polish newspaper, the index. And there again, it, it doesn't contain only Polish names, but people of all ethnic backgrounds. And one thing that I found interesting is that the ads are in Polish, so Poles would find it easier to shop at places like Avery Lumber, hardly a Polish lumber company, so they were German neighbors. But, like I said, feel free to look through those. Uh, there is an index for the paper and for the institute. Um, one last thing I'll mention, if I may, coming up is the uh, 98th Annual Pilgrimage to the great site of General Haller's recruits. I was just going to say that. It's Next coming slide. up Sunday, June 14th this year. So if anybody wants to look at, here's the paperwork on that, if anybody wants to uh, get particulars. It's Niagara on the Lake. We're coming up on the 100th anniversary, a couple more years. Mm -hmm. And El could probably tell us more about that. I, I went one time to that. There's, well, there's a big mass. They have an outdoor chapel, and there's a main. Well, first there's a parade from the center of town uh -huh. to the uh, to the outdoor chapel and the cemetery, and there's a section of the cemetery that's set off by a, an iron grate that is Haller's recruits, uh -huh. and there's a there's a chapel there and a place to celebrate the mass, and they have a mass there outdoors in the heat, and um, and then after the mass, then there's another parade. To the downtown, where there's a lot more speeches, and, um, and um, I went once, and my bias is once is enough. <laughs> but 
But for those who haven't. But, but for those who haven't, it's an experience. You should go. And uh, you shouldn't put it off because I heard a rumor that the local American PAC, this is the last time they're going because people are getting old. So. It may start to dwindle. Niagara on the Lake, Ontario, yes. Yeah, you wouldn't expect a Polish soldier. Yeah. But we'll move along to the Armenians. I'll tell you a little bit about the Armenians. They began uh, coming uh, very great presence in the city of Niagara Falls. Uh, Pete also introduced me to the Armenians actually because of Oakwood Cemetery, the great numbers of people. Armenians buried at Oakwood Cemetery. Uh, I think you did you count over 400 just yeah, by the names? Over 500, 500 Armenians buried there. Um, and these people fled terrible persecution, genocide at the hands of the Turkish government in several different waves of um, events. Um, they began arriving first in the mid-1890s, and then large groups came in the, from 1918 to 1926 due to the great genocide of that time period. And I was able to make myself more intimate with the story of the Armenian people through um, the story of one woman, Zozan Gavoyan, who was buried at Oakwood Cemetery, and her daughter actually had, came in the library one day and said she needed help photocopying something, and it turns out I had been talking to Pete, and I said, gosh, I wish I had an Armenian story, and the lady walks up to me with this Armenian story that was an interview with her grandmother, that uh, her grandmother passed away, but um, they taped it, and then she transcribed it, and she was having trouble on the computer. I said, oh my God, this is just... Incredible. I mean, you all do genealogy, you know this, these things happen. <laughs> so um, I learned so much about the Armenian people. I, I never knew anything. And uh, through Zozan's story, and uh, we went to her, you know, her grave is at Oakwood. Her family is just wonderful people. And um, I learned what these people went through. And as I said again, the people that I grew up knowing, that I knew were of Armenian descent, I never knew this is where they came from. It's horrible horrors that are in their family history. Um, and they came and Niagara Falls took them in and uh, many are very successful, wonderful people that came out of the nightmare. Um, uh, and I do have the story on Oakwood's website if you're interested. It was, I think one of the things I've worked on that touched me more than anything was this one woman's story. And they settled around um, 9th, 10th, and 11th streets. St. Peter's Episcopal Church is actually the church that assisted them in the beginning in the early days, and you can see that in the church records. Unfortunately, it's so hard to see everything, but here's a little snippet from St. Peter's Episcopal Church that shows Armenians. Uh, is it a birth? I think it's a baptism. Mm -hmm. um, and Monroe Fordham website has uh, Pete again is working on getting all these church records um, digitized on this website, so they're all together. Then they ended up building their own churches in Niagara Falls, and. They are the only, were the only Armenian churches within 150 miles. Now, um, as I said, some records would be special to the Armenian people. Oakwood, again, has a lot of records. You walk through Oakwood and you see so many tombstones, and a lot of them have stories on them. They have their flags that they put up to commemorate yeah. the massacre about a month ago. It's in April. But, but we have a large Armenian community, and many attached to Oakwood because their family is there. Um, other local vital records, of course, naturalization, um, family search microfilm. Here's some that's available. Um, and again, the church. And I, I tried getting, I don't know if you know of the, these church St. Sarkis, and do they have records available? Or? They disappeared. They all disappeared. Somebody took them to do something with them, and they never brought them back. Yeah, so it's always a battle. Now, Alice Moradian is another very special woman. I'd love to put her on this uh, statue, monument too, because wow. When you read about her, daughter of John and Altoon, again, um, fleeing all this persecution there. She was born in America, but she was a brilliant woman. I mean, so beyond her time. She graduated from Niagara Falls High School at the age of 15, when women couldn't even vote. Women weren't considered anything. She graduated at 15 years old, and she was Elizabeth Howe's main woman. She was her stenographer at first at 18 years old. She also, then she ended up teaching classes because Elizabeth realized she was a gem. So Alice started teaching um, class, English classes. And 
she she did a lot of work, but she um, degree in sociology from the University of Chicago, um, and then she did a lot of other numerous volunteer organizations, also buried in Oakwood. And I always remember when you found her grave, it was she didn't have any children. She was never married. Never married. Yeah. So. Her grave was just completely surrounded by brush and shrubberies. And one day I went in the cemetery, and there he is. And he's uh, spent the whole day, if not more. I mean, there was a trees grown around her tombstone. And uh, it was a beautiful thing when he uncovered it all, because what a special woman she was. I forgot, again, forgotten. Um, she also started the Golden Age yes. group, which was in the area of the First Baptist Church. When I was on the Girl Scout staff in the 50s, she was no, running that, and it was fantastic. So she never she was part of the Council of Social Agencies. And, um, Just a wonderful yeah. woman that came out of this ethnic community of Niagara Falls. Um, trying to move she along here. Everyone's melting. Can you move on? Yes. Yeah. mention something about uh, uh, no more Armenian churches than the other churches. Are you talking less? At that time, yeah, oh, in the last, so yeah, yeah. Um, okay, the Lithuanians again. I didn't know anything about Lithuanians. I knew some of my friends were Lithuanian, and you could tell they're very blonde, blue eyes. Um, and my um, brother-in-law is Lithuanian. His mother actually educated me a lot on the Lithuanians. And then I, in Dr. Fader's book, he has quite a bit because it was quite a large population of Niagara Falls too. They settled around 12th and. 19th Street. Um, this is a picture of St. George's Roman Catholic Church, which is not uh, actually the Canadians. I think it's a different church in there now. It's an Anglo Catholic. Anglo Catholic Anglo Catholic that owns it, and then they have the Magdalena Project in there as well. Okay. So it does a lot for women um, on drugs, prostitution, we'll try and get them off, and they do various things as well. Yeah. So it's wonderful. Another building saved, and there's a lot of history of this beautiful building. Uh, considered spiritual home of the Lithuanian people. Um, I just want to focus on this Zygmunt Fushtis. He is my brother-in-law's grandfather, great-grandfather. Um, Lori actually introduced me to him. Her family had a beautiful history book put together of her family history. And he was born in Chirkai, Lithuania, in 1909. And she said, he, he told her that the reason he left was the Russians were coming in, and he literally left under gunfire. Um, came to Niagara Falls. He married Ursula Zobsta at Holy Trinity. Again, a lot of the Lithuanians before um, St. George, they were Holy Trinity, and even afterwards. But he, there's some cute stories where he um, worked on the building the catwalk for the man of the scheme. And then he worked for the Illuminate Company of America. And he was one of the people who helped to build the church. And she's very proud of that. And here's the marriage record, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, wonderful marriage records on family search for Niagara Falls, Niagara County, at that this time period that we're looking at. And there they are in their wedding. It's beautiful. Holy Trinity. Um, the Lithuanian records, I really don't know of any others around here, except through Family Search, of course, that our library is an affiliate of Family Search, so we can, or you can order a microphone and have it sent to Lewis the Library. Um, and there's an archives online that is wonderful, taking you back into Lithuania. I, I didn't really strip down into too much, but uh, again, Holy Trinity and St. George's Church kept in divine mercy. Yes, also Our Lady of the Rosary and Our Lady of the All of those records would have gone over to the okay. So if you're looking for them, this is where they are. It's a lot of changes in Niagara Falls with the Catholic Church and the Okay, now the fun stuff for the genealogists. Like I said, we're, we're melting, so I'm not going to take too long. As you all know, the, best, the first place you want to start finding these records is your family and any pictures, documents. I have so many people come to the library and they're like, I don't have anything, I don't know. And then they come, I said, well, check this, check this. And they come back and they have all these amazing things that help us move on a little bit. These are some um, people I recognize from our family. Um, of course, the census records. 
are wonderful because, uh, and you can get them on Ancestry.com free in any libraries if you don't have a subscription. A subscription. Um, but again, it's a bird's eye view into the neighborhood, into your family at a certain time, at, at one day in their life. You see where they lived, their neighborhood, who lived next door to them, what streets they lived on. Um, wonderful source. Uh, the passenger records. This is my great grandmother. She came through uh, Montreal, Canada first, because it was cheaper. They were so poor, they had to come the cheapest way. Uh, and I believe my grandmother said her father even smuggled her over the border to come to Niagara Falls. <laughs> but you get a lot of information on these kind of records. Um, birthplace, uh, why? And I'm finding too when we're helping other people. Who were they coming to America? Who sponsored them? Where were they going? And that answers a lot of your questions when you see that. It gives you an address. If you can read them, sometimes they're terrible. But she was going to Welland first. Her religion is on there. Of course, a lot of them we already know the religion. Oh, passports are wonderful too. This is a Greek person that I'm working on a passport. And sometimes it's really hard to find the cities and the towns and all that. Because if you want to do research back in the old country, you need to know that town or you can't do anything. So uh, again, on Ancestry.com. Um, this is a uh, birth record from Niagara Falls. Um, of course, the birth, marriage, death, the vital records. In Niagara Falls, um, the Niagara Falls City Clerk, you can get these. Or, well, they'll give you a transcribed one. This is actually part of the parallel collection at our library that someone donated all these all these birth records, all this type of thing from just one family. Um, St. Joseph's Cemetery records and, and other cemetery records are wonderful to have. Um, the St. Joseph Cemetery records don't really have much information except for the death, date, and uh, I even have the cemetery contacting me for maps of the early, remember I, I took a terrible picture of a map from the early time, I can find it now, but the cemetery is asking me, do you have any maps of the cemetery? So, but you know, in the old days, they kept really, they just folded it up in the back of the book and it was all wet. But we tried to figure out what's on these pages. Oh, the directory is one of my favorite, um, especially to research the ethnic communities of Niagara Falls because, again, you have the streets, you have, uh, it'll, it'll tell them, what, tell you what they did, and you get all these little ads. Um, Sometimes it will say someone died that year. So always, always look at the directories. And you could go year by year. There's a few years missing, but um, there's maps in them that will take you right into the street level. So directory is a wonderful thing. And they're also on Ancestry.com, or the libraries have a lot of them, too. Naturalization papers. Um, these are my grandfather's. Um, again, always filled with lots of mistakes if you know a lot of the information on it, but very cheap to obtain and Lockport at the historian's office now, right? That's where they moved from. If I had gotten them elsewhere. But uh, again, you have addresses, you have, and sometimes it's interesting to see um, who the people that signed for them and that kind of thing, because sometimes they're your family or they're people you might know or heard of. Um, I mentioned before that MonroeFordham.com, wonderful site for Niagara Falls church records, which I know the Niagara Falls Library is very instrumental, Pete and Larry, and um, getting these records digitized, saving them. And it's, it's just great because you just go to this one website and here's all the church records. And the St. Peter's Episcopal is fantastic because there's the deaths records uh, in there, I mean, like cause of death, everything. but. This one I found interesting, a lot of Armenians in St. Peter's, and um, of course it's a real faded line, can't see it probably, but um, Alice Meridian and Elizabeth Howe were the sponsors for this Armenian baptism, which I thought was pretty neat. Burial records, another source that is my great grandmother's from Riverdale Cemetery, gives you some more information. And the, these people from 1880 to, you know, this period, there are a lot of records available for researching them, is what I'm trying to show you here. Because the time period, they kept records. 
Um, this is uh, Find a Grave, which you're probably all familiar with. Sometimes you get lucky and um, St. Joseph Cemetery, somebody adds them in as soon as uh, my aunt recently passed away and her stuff was immediately added there. So um, it's a wonderful thing to use. They have obituaries, pictures of the stones, uh, great stuff. I have mom, your DNA. Um, the DNA tests, a lot of people are doing that now. We're, we've been doing it like crazy. And what's great about the DNA test is not only does it show your ancestral background. I, I use my mom's because she's more Italian than me. My mother's like more Italian than a, an Italian person. <laughs> because she's, what was it, Seb, well, the average Italian in Italy is 72% of Italy, Greece. My mother's 73, so I don't know how that happened. But then they also have a lot of the Caucasus, which is like Turkey and Lebanon and places like that, which is interesting to see the migration of people in your blood, you know. But along with the fun part of showing your ancestry, it hooks you up to cousins, which is, a lot of us, it's just been remarkable. And uh, I just have an example of one lady that, um, because in my test, she's a little more, di for my mother, she's closer to her DNA, like a closer cousin. But you try to match the names, see, you know, well, where can we match? And then for some of these people, it just opens up this whole world for you of ancestors you never knew about or, you know, things you were stuck on. So it, it is another tool for um, genealogists if you're interested and you want to do that. Um, Facebook. Facebook has a lot, uh, I mean, you can hook up with these cousins as you meet through things like that that live in all parts of the world. Um, in fact, I have one from Germany right now who just went to our hometown in Germany. And we just recently found that we're related to my dad. His great his great grandmother and my great grandfather were brother and sister. So it's a very close relationship. Um, and it's through Facebook that I we met and he doesn't speak any English. So I try to like Google translate my messages to him into German and he's doing it in English, so it's kinda of funny, but uh, he's in the hometown right now and he sent me like a hundred pictures, you know, so um, you can also find pages that have Polish genealogy, Sicilian, and Italian, whatever. And the people on some of these sites are just fabulous. In fact, the reason this cousin and I found each other was because of a Facebook, a German site. I had just asked someone, I put my family name in, and uh, I said, I'm stuck, whatever. This woman got on and she knew everything. And she gave me my great great grandmother's name, all this stuff. and. Um, she was from Normandy, France, so we had some weird time things. I'd be waiting to see her responses, but she connected us together, me and this other man. And uh, and now it's just amazing things because he has all the church records. He has, and my grandfather kind of disappeared from the family. He was the only one that came to America. So Facebook is just a wonderful thing. If you just want to use it for genealogy, it, it's really worth it because it brings the world together. I told you before the Niagara County marriages, um, the ones for this we're, we're talking about, 8, 1908 to 1936. Family search free of charge. Um, this is my great grandparents' marriage record. It's just a beautiful record with their signatures on it, with uh, their address. My grandmother was worked in a factory. Um, their parents' names, um, and this was for everyone from this time period, from Niagara Falls or Niagara County free on family search. Now in those um, flyers that you got, I hope everyone got one, it has a lot of what I'm talking about now. Um, our microfilm at the library, it was the library we have, um, we're building a collection, we have a lot of the Italians. We have everything that's local, Niagara Falls, in the library. And this is an example of one of the um, General Holler's records that Pete was talking about. And, it's pretty interesting. You have their weight and height and all that kind of stuff. Even so, um, family websites. My gosh, if you're a crazy genealogist, you know you're going to be googling your names and places and stuff like that. And there are some great websites um, and people that will help you because they you have a common thing you're looking for. So even if you have you know an ethnic, I mean I think a lot of people didn't realize. 
you know, I'm Italian, Polish, Lithuanian. No, there, I can't do family history. Well, you can't. These things are different now. Um, here's one of the Italian record sites that's free from the Italian government, actually. The Portali Antonati at uh, 37 state archives. Uh, they changed a little bit so it's easier to maneuver now, but these are original records going back to some of the 1700s. So if you have good eyes <laughs> and you're patient. Um, here's the some of these are on Fulton history, the Polish weekly review. Some are in English too. I didn't realize. Oh, yeah. Some are in English. This is in English. I sent him the one microfilm to digitize. Oh you did? That's yeah, where that's okay. Right. Um, the Niagara Falls Gazette, you all know Fulton history, right? Um, what a great place to research uh, your ethnic people because you get obituaries, uh, pictures. Like, look at that beautiful picture for their anniversary. Um, and little ads like this, the National Lunch was a Greek family I'm helping to research right now. And she was thrilled to see that, oh my gosh, there were ads in the paper? Who knows? Who knew there were things like that? So, um, of course, some of the pictures are terribly blurry, and the Gazette doesn't have any of them. They got rid of all their originals, so it might be all you've got. But it's really exciting when you find something that's, you know, yours. This is a great um, website that Lou O'Mell, I know some of you know Lou, and he introduced this to me, World Names Public Profiler. It is fantastic. It is so accurate. You could put a name in it. All you do is you put a surname in it, and you put, um, it asks for your address, and if you're male or female, just for statistical reasons. So, um, you put it in, and then it'll tell you, it goes through, it has like directories, phone books, things like that, where it pulls out where this name is most prevalent. And then it will take you to that. And then it tells you other names from that town, or that city, or that area. And it is wonderful. I'll just give you an example how accurate um, my husband's last name, Kratz, is they changed the spelling because of the wars with Germany, whatever. And his family came in the 1700s, and it was K-R-A-T-Z as a German name. Well, now in the 8th, I forget when they changed it, but K-R-A-T-T-S. So if I put in K-R-A-T-T-S, it only shows America. And it shows where his family settled. But if I put K-R-E-T-Z, it takes you to Germany. And I also did this, I couldn't see, understand the, um, I got one of my great-grandmother, great-greats, um, her death record. And of course, it was from Boston area, and they botched the, everything. And the name just didn't seem right at all. So I played with different names in this World Names Profiler. Just moved vowels around, whatever, and it came up, and it showed the same name as her husband's last name, the town, so I knew that was the right spelling, you know. A little detective work, but it's a wonderful thing to use. Um, of course, the Niagara County Genealogical Society, you know, we're right at time, and the historian's office is um, a wonderful place for uh, naturalization records. First of all, it's where I went to get all my family's records. Um, you don't want to miss out getting that. And local societies, I'll let you know, but I hope they'll give me records of my grandfather. But um, they do have it, and these kind of societies are what preserve the heritage and uh, the traditions. And then here's the Polish Genealogical Society of America. There's um, websites you can join these organizations, and they do a lot of um, genealogy things. They can direct you to uh, places. Um, when I told you about the how to find what the ethnic makeup of your area is, you can go to factfinder.census.gov and that will give you, you can punch in like I put in Niagara Falls and it will tell you as of 2013 the first ancestry recorded. And it's kind of interesting to look through because I was surprised to see some of them. And uh, it's all in the sheets here so you can do that later. Um, and also Make sure you look at, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, Dr. Fader, who was supposed to be the presenter today, his wonderful book that's about this thick, his dissertation, uh, doctoral dissertation, uh, we have at the library. I believe it's even for sale at the book corner, possibly. That's where I got one recently. 
And we um, transcribe the reports of Ms. Elizabeth how we have it at the library with an index so you can even look up people that are in it. She mentions a lot of people. Just even as a story, I wish I could just get this out to the world because we, you know, it's just an, un, it should be a movie. She should be like, on, she should be on a money. She's just such a wonderful woman. Uh, and as I said, um, we have a few things over here. Uh, if you want to sign the petition to sign, to put her name on. This is the one to sign. Yeah, if, if you would like to put her name on this monument, we're just going to get as many signatures as we can. I'm going to go to mayor. Hopefully he remembers me. <laughs> and say, you know, this is something I think would be really nice. Um, she was uh, just a, in a great spirit in Niagara Falls history, and she did for all of us. And these are the books that uh, we've worked on. Uh, we have one of Tito. And this, uh, we did this because Macri's restaurant in Houston did a little benefit for us, the library, and gave it all to our genealogy group. And we thought, okay, what can we do to thank them? So we decided, let's write this. I love to write, so I said, let's write all these stories, our family's stories, and other people's stories into a book. And the Italian story is just food. Food, food, food. So <laughs> all the businesses, <laughs> and there's recipes, and there's photos, and um, it, it's, it really took off. We've sold over a thousand copies. And yeah. It's a fun book. It's a happy it's book. Even if you aren't from Niagara Falls, or you're not Italian, a lot of Niagara Falls history in here. And because it just got oh, out of control, I mean, we have so many stories, so many people we couldn't put in there. Now we have, uh, this is the order we want to order. Oh, and we're working on a new book right now. Um, with the stories we couldn't fit in there, but it's not just culinary. Like we have the Capitol Theater story. We have just millions of stories. Again, we couldn't even fit that in one book, so we're gonna have volume one and two. And there's poetry, even my little daughter, my nine-year-old wrote a story in the book. So um, very happy, fun pictures, ads. Um, if you're interested in the new book, it should be coming out soon, um, you could sign here and we'll let you know when it's available because we're finishing it up. Actually, Michelle, these books are going to be a source of genealogical information for our grandchildren someday. Yeah. Because the stories are just all personal and amazing. You know, that's what I love is once since we wrote that story, I've had people come in the library, you know, little old people, and they're like, "This, you, my grandma's in here." Or you know, I don't think they knew their families were worthy of being history. You know, so now they're so excited and. Every, there's like a lot of energy because Niagara Falls is a wonderful city. I mean, there's a lot of bad press, a lot of stuff, you know, in the news all the time, negative, negative. But there are, you know, it hurts when your family was a part of making this city something special. And we don't want to hear that all the time. So we want to put these stories together, these beautiful stories, and uh, share them. And I don't, as a librarian, I don't want to just keep everything in a folder in my office and then. I leave and they clean everything, throw it all out. So I figure, okay, there's like a thousand copies of this. There's got to be something <laughs> that'll live, you know. So um, we also, after we finish the Italians, we're working on all of the ethnic communities of Niagara Falls because we thought, how fun to do an Armenian grocery store story, um, to do, you know, all these type of stories. And people just come to us like crazy. They really want to be a part of it, and I feel like it's it's their book too. So, if you're interested and you have your, you know have ethnic stories of Niagara Falls, let us know, and we have a sign up sheet. We'll let call you back when we're ready, and we're going to be very busy. Yeah. If anyone's interested in helping, I know you are, but we think it's a great cause to save the history. It really is. So thank you for melting. Yeah.